Strike fighters are among the most versatile of modern combat aircraft. Part fighter, part bomber, these dual-purpose aircraft excel in both offensive and defensive air combat. The single-seat fighter has dominated air combat since the earliest days of aerial warfare. Although mainly intended for battling other aircraft, the fighter has long been used in another role. Fitted with bombs or other types of weapons, the fighter can also attack ground targets. These dual-purpose fighters are referred to as strike bombers or strike fighters. An example of this type of aircraft is the U.S. Navy's F.A. 18 Hornet strike fighter, which ably demonstrated its capabilities during Operation Desert Storm in 1991. There, two Hornets were on a bombing sortie when they were ambushed by two Iraqi MiG fighters. The Hornets instantly switched to dogfighting mode. Successful in shooting down the MiGs with air-to-air -air missiles, they resumed their bombing mission. Previous generation fighters lacking the computer prowess of the Hornets would have needed to discard their bombs in order to defend themselves in a dogfight. The configuration of modern strike fighters is shaped by their missions. Ground attack falls into several categories. Close air support generally means combat missions in the immediate battle area alongside friendly forces. In these missions, the aircraft are often assigned to attack enemy tanks or troop concentrations. Accuracy of delivery is essential in order to avoid casualties to friendly forces. Another important mission for strike fighters is called battlefield interdiction. In the interdiction role, the primary targets are military forces deep behind the front lines. These operations include striking such high-value targets as command headquarters, supply bases, vital bridges, enemy artillery, and reserve forces moving up to the front. Since these attacks are carried out deep into enemy territory, the strike fighter must be able to survive the onslaught of anti-air defense systems, such as radar-directed missiles. Modern strike fighters often evade these defenses by relying on low-flying tactics, taking advantage of the terrain to hide from enemy radar. The Harrier vertical takeoff jet is a unique variety of strike fighter. The Harrier was developed in Britain in the 1960s to fulfill a special requirement. In modern air wars, air bases are a prime target. If a runway is destroyed, then high-performance jet fighters are effectively grounded. The Harrier overcomes this dilemma with its vertical takeoff and landing capability known as Vistol. Though it can launch and land like a conventional jet, its Rolls-Royce engine is specially configured so that it can be vented downwards, enabling the Harrier to take off and land vertically. A Harrier can operate from small clearings near the battle area, regardless of the conditions of local runways. The Falklands War in 1982 demonstrated the versatility of the Harrier. Uh, without the Harrier, there would have been no air power for the British Navy and uh, for the British Air Force. So we use that also in the central region and in other places. We can operate away from airfields 
away from uh, long strips, either in the woods, on ships, on strips, on a bit of tarmac roads near villages. You can use it any, anywhere. The sophistication of the Harrier's engine means the pilot has a larger array of controls than most fighter aircraft. It is an extra lever, an extra throttle lever, which uh, normally they, for forward flight, the nozzles are pointing aft. And when you want to slow down into the hover, you bring that lever back and the nozzles go down to the vertical or to slow down even quicker forward of the vertical. And then as you slow down and the wing loses lift, then you have to replace that with engine power. So you bring up the engine to high power settings to compensate for that loss of lift. So in effect, when you're in the hover, you're sitting on a column of air from the engine. In spite of the added complexity presented by the engine, the Harrier is popular with its flight crews due to its handling abilities. I think it's a tremendous aircraft to fly because it's so unique. It's got the, the uh, helicopter type qualities and the normal conventional aircraft qualities. The central mission for the Royal Air Force's Harrier GR-5 is the ground attack mission. But the Falklands fighting made it clear that the Harrier can perform in the fighter role as well. We find that we do a lot more air combat than even the uh, air defense guys. They do radar combat and we do a lot of um, aircraft to aircraft fighting. So a lot, of our, a lot of our training is pure air combat, I'd imagine 40% of it. So whenever the weather is not good or we've done a tremendous amount of low level, we go up and we do combat. The United States Marine Corps has been an enthusiastic supporter of the jump jet concept. The Marines currently fly the AV-8B Harrier II, a second generation of the aircraft developed in cooperation by British Aerospace and McDonnell Douglas. The Harrier's adjustable avionics are especially suited for Marine pilots. Uh, being a Harrier pilot is kind of special because I think we're the, we're the best we're the best pilots. We're the best stick and rudder men, I think, in military aviation. It's the best of both worlds. I mean, you hover like a helicopter, and you fly straight and level like a regular aircraft. Uh, it's not supersonic like some of the other uh, high-speed uh, fighter aircraft, but it, it maneuvers very well, and it's very versatile. We only need a 2,000-foot aluminum strip to take off. And of course, you can land in a spot the size of a tennis court. The Marines' interest in the Harrier can be traced to their special role in America's armed forces. The Marines have traditionally been employed as an expeditionary force, able to carry out combat assignments thousands of miles from major bases. The Harrier is a complement to Marine operations, since it can operate from small Navy carriers. Once the Marines have secured a beachhead, the Harriers provide close air support from the shore itself. Although the Harrier is usually viewed as a close air support aircraft for marine ground units, it is capable of carrying out deep attack missions as well. This is due in large part to improvements incorporated in the newer AV-8B Harrier II, which has nearly twice the range of the Harrier I. During the 1991 Gulf War, Harrier units were the primary source of close air support for marine ground force units. During the opening phases of Desert Storm, the Harriers flew strike missions deep into Kuwait, attacking storage facilities, artillery positions, and other vital targets. Once the ground war began, the Harrier switched missions and began providing close air support for Marine ground forces during the liberation of Kuwait. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, better known as the Warthog, is one of the oddest looking strike aircraft in the world. Projecting from its blunt nose is a 30 millimeter cannon, specially designed to destroy armored vehicles. This weapon, the Gao-8 Gatling gun, fires 15 ounce depleted uranium projectiles at a rate of 70 per second. The A-10 was designed specifically to hunt and attack tanks, Moving at hundreds of miles an hour, fast strike fighters find it nearly impossible to locate and destroy relatively small targets such as tanks. 
and tanks are so heavily armored that they require a direct hit to eliminate. The A-10, although large, is graceful and maneuverable at low altitudes in a manner not found in fast jets. The A-10's unique design came about in part as a result of the Vietnam War. During Vietnam, many expensive fighter bombers were shot down by small arms fire. The A-10 was designed to survive in the close attack environment against machine gun fire. This became very clear in the Gulf War in 1991, where warthogs flew 8,100 sorties. It's highly protected. We have titanium around the uh, cockpit to protect the pilot. It has dual control surfaces, everything uh, back up. We had one land with no hydraulics, uh, pretty well shot up. It can take a lot of damage and it can still come back and, and maybe fight another day or at least get the asset of the pilot back uh, to, to the friendly side, which is real good. The A-10 has been the ugly duckling of the U.S. Air Force in more ways than one. Before the 91 Gulf War, many in the Air Force wanted it retired from service or relegated to observation duties. They felt that its slow speed would make it vulnerable to enemy fighter aircraft. But over Kuwait, with Iraqi fighter opposition non-existent, the A-10 was ideal. The main threat to coalition planes was Iraqi anti-aircraft fire, and no other strike aircraft is as well protected as the A-10. Its slow speed and high maneuverability made it ideally suited for pinpoint attacks on Iraqi tanks and other hardened targets. One of the tactics resurrected during the Gulf War was the use of forward air control aircraft, such as Marine OV-10s. They would circle over an area and pick out targets for the oncoming A-10s. Having a forward air controller with binoculars there to confirm that and watch uh, what we were doing really helped out. He was able to say, yeah, those are tanks in the revetments versus us having to go down lower altitude to look before we shot. Uh, you don't want to shoot another tank that somebody else already had and wasted munitions, so that worked out real well. The A-10 can carry a wide variety of bombs, including both conventional and laser-guided bombs. A standard weapon of the A-10 is the Maverick missile. The Maverick can be launched miles away from its target, allowing the pilot to stay a safe distance from enemy anti-aircraft guns. As this test footage shows, the Maverick has a devastating effect on tanks. No one would call the A-10 a fighter plane, but it does carry Sidewinder missiles to defend itself from enemy fighters. And although intended to shoot tanks, the GAO-8 cannon can provide air-to-air -air protection. Although the A-10 was intended for short-distance engagements, it is fitted with a refueling receptacle on its nose, which allows it to be refueled in flight to extend its range. In combat against an opponent with a large fighter force, the A-10 would not be committed to deep attack missions. Yet once air superiority is established by other fighters, the A-10 can operate with relative impunity. The Tornado represents a very different approach to the strike mission than the Harrier or the Warthog. It is a deep strike aircraft intended to carry out the battlefield interdiction mission deep into enemy territory. This requires a level of sophistication not found on the Harrier or Warthog. The Tornado was designed from the outset as a multi-purpose aircraft. There are two versions of the Tornado. The Tornado F-3 is an air defense interceptor designed solely for air combat. The Tornado GR-1 is the strike fighter version designed for the attack role. The GR-1 was the first variant and entered service with Britain's Royal Air Force in 1982. The critical difference between both types is their radar. 
The Tornado F3 uses a Fox Hunter radar, which is specifically designed for finding and engaging enemy aircraft at long range. The Tornado GR1's radar is a terrain-following ground attack type. It is designed to allow the Tornado to fly safely at very low altitudes at speeds of over 500 miles per hour. The idea behind this tactic is that the Tornado can remain hidden from enemy anti-aircraft radars by exploiting terrain features. Ground-based radars are not very efficient at finding aircraft at low altitudes since terrain features such as trees, hills or even buildings can obstruct their view. The radar on the Tornado GR-1 can be set to a terrain following mode which guides the aircraft over the ground at a predetermined height to avoid major obstructions. During the 91 Gulf War, the Tornado GR-1 formed the backbone of the Royal Air Force's deep strike capability. The initial night mission of the GR-1s was to attack Iraqi air bases using JP-233 anti-runway munitions. This was one of the most dangerous assignments in the coalition air assault, with the Tornado Squadron suffering many losses. Once the runways were destroyed, the Tornadoes switched missions and munitions. Their targets were expanded to cover key installations deep in Iraq. Because of the Tornado's sophisticated radar, targets could be attacked accurately, even at night. The munitions they used were tailored for their missions. Laser-guided bombs for pinpoint targets. Conventional unguided bombs for most other targets. Bridges were a specialty of the tornado force. In this footage, shot during a tornado attack on an Iraqi bridge, the crosshairs mark where the laser designator is being directed. The guided bomb senses the reflected laser beam and homes in on the bridge with remarkable precision. During the Gulf War, the Royal Saudi Air Force also flew the Tornado GR-1 as its principal strike aircraft. As in the British case, when low-level missions were necessary, night operations were the rule. Once the Iraqi radar defenses had been effectively eliminated, the best the Iraqis could do was to fire blindly into the night sky. But night attacks are long and arduous. After a mission deep behind enemy lines, the first glimpse of the home base's runway is always a welcome sight. In 1998, the upgraded Tornado GR-4 entered service. GR-4s incorporate a variety of systems upgrades, including forward-looking infrared radar, a new heads-up display, and GPS-guided bombs. In March 2003, Tornado GR-4s were dispatched in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. As capable as the versatile strike fighters are today, their designs are decades old and eventually they will be replaced. In 1996, the U.S. Department of Defense began the replacement process with the initiation of the Joint Strike Fighter Program. The aim of which was to replace all of these aircraft with a single design. Boeing and Lockheed Martin were selected to build aircraft that would meet specific requirements low-speed handling, such as that of the Warthog, carrier approach to meet the Navy's requirements, short takeoff and vertical landing with hover capability, like the Harrier. Boeing submitted the YF-32, which was designed to be powerful, lightweight, and extremely maneuverable. It would have a range and payload capacity greater than any of the planes it was designed to replace. 
It would also have faster acceleration and be more agile. Stealthy and supersonic, the twin-engine YF-32 would have 85% commonality among its many variants. Despite the strengths of Boeing's YF-32, in 2001 the Pentagon awarded the largest military contract in history to its competitor, Lockheed Martin's YF-35. As much as $200 billion will go toward the Joint Strike Fighter program, now designated the F-35. More than 2,800 F-35s have been ordered, with delivery beginning in 2008. Three variants will be produced to meet the different needs of the American Air Force, Navy, Marines, as well as the British Royal Air Force and Navy. The F-35A will replace the U.S. Air Force's F-16 Falcon and A-10 Warthog aircraft and will partner with the F-A-22 Raptor Air Superiority Fighter. The F-35B will feature short takeoff and vertical landing to suit the needs of the U.S. Marine Corps, the Royal Air Force and Royal Navy. This variant will replace the Harrier, the Sea Harrier, the F-A-18 Hornet, and the GR-7 Tornado. The U.S. Navy will fly the F-35C variant, which will serve alongside their new Super Hornets. It will have larger wing and tail control surfaces for low-speed carrier operations, and its airframe will be strengthened to absorb the stress of catapult launches and arrested landings. The radar-evading F-35 Joint Strike Fighter is expected to be the world's premier strike aircraft through 2040, providing air superiority second only to the F-A-22 Raptor. Part Fighter Part bomber, the versatile strike fighters play an important role on today's battlefield. As the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter takes to the skies, the strike fighter legacy will be carried on well into the 21st century.